Good day, Saul. First of all, let me thank you uh, for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Certainly, I'm happy to do it. And uh, for our audience, I just need to come become honest here with uh, the fact that this is our second attempt to do this because I screwed up royally the first time we did this. And then we had a couple of vacations in between and we're finally getting back to this. So, uh, Saul, for our audience, uh, would you please introduce yourself, give us your name and uh, tell us where you live? Um, um, still Saul Carliner and I live in Montreal, um, Quebec in Canada. And uh, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, um, where you went to college and what you studied and give us a little bit about your educational background? Sure. Um, I have three degrees. I have a bachelor's degree from Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, where I majored in economics, professional writing, public policy and management. And believe it or not, I actually had a minor in administration and management science and if they'd accepted my nonprofit marketing course for the marketing requirement for the minor, I would have had a fourth major. Um, I also volunteered a lot when I was in college. Um, I was representative to the college council. I was editor of the yearbook, managing editor of the newspaper. Um, I was a member of ISEC, which is a French acronym for the Association Internationale des Étudiants. Um, they study étudier in uh, économique et uh, commerce. I think that's what it means, and it's basically a business students organization, and they sponsor uh, interchanges between uh, universities in different countries. Um, and then I did graduate school. Um, I always did my grad studies working full time for the most part, um, although I did did take educational leaves both time. And then I was working full time and I'm um, going to school part time, which is a little different than a lot of other people do it. Um, I was on the tuition um, remission plan and also on work study plan, which where my employer would reimburse all my tuition expenses, in some cases books. So I got my master's of, believe it or not, agriculture in technical communication at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Um, and even though it's it happened to be in the agricultural faculty at the time. Um, they've since moved to the College of Liberal Arts and it became an MS the year after I, actually the year I graduated, they, they shifted to an MS program. And then my PhD is instructional technology and that's from Georgia State University. Well, thank you for that background. So uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to have you share with us next is uh, some of your job progressions and perhaps this goes back and intermingles with your educational uh, experiences, but uh, can you share with us a little bit, bit about your journey and then get into the the aspects regarding uh, performance improvement and instructional design mm -hmm. and such and and you know share with us any interesting stories about uh, projects and efforts that you've been involved in? Well, um, it's it's a couple of journeys. In some cases, it was a literal journey. In other cases, it was uh, just gaining experience. So I started as a tech writer for IBM in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, and I worked in that job for several years before I became an instructional designer with the manufacturing training department in that, um, the plant I was working at. And while I started, literally right after I started the um, job as an instructional designer, I began work on my master's degree in technical communication. And so I did that for about, I was going to school part-time, working full-time for about a year and a half. And then I took a six month educational leave to finish up the classwork for my master's. It's a little slow about finishing up the final paper. It took about a year, but at the end of that leave, I moved down to Atlanta to work for IBM's um, PC training unit. So we did all of the training for the uh, IBM personal computer. This was in the mid eighties. And so e on the one hand, what we now call e-learning or was then called computer-based training wasn't particularly widespread, but I began working with CBT, as we called it, back in my first job in manufacturing training. And then that was what got me hired for the second job with the PC line. Um, we were, they had one training program that had been done on interactive video disc, and they wanted to do something a lot more complex that would serve multiple audiences, and at the same time, do it with a single set of modules, which is something that you hear about a lot today, but that was not even remotely common back in the 80s. So that was a really kind of fascinating project. And I worked on setting editorial standards for it, 
um, in addition to working on particular modules um, for that particular project. And we had a, a parallel project working on for IBM's mid-sized computer. And because I worked on those pri previously, I did a little work on that project with the operative board being little. After I've been in that job for a couple of years, um, I began my PhD. But soon after I began those studies, then I began yet another job. And this was going back to communication. Um, I began a four-year stint in the marketing unit for IBM's um, customer education business unit. They spun all of us off as a separate business. We had profit and loss, profit and um, revenue um, objectives that we had to achieve. And I ran all the marketing communications programs um, for their unit. So I did, did everything that anyone would do in that kind of business. So I was doing business shows, catalogs, press releases, um, setting corporate identity. So, but it was nice having a background in instructional design, plus also having a background, um, an academic background that was emerging in instructional technology because a lot of the instructors, and I found this true of anybody who's a teacher, they generally don't trust people who are not teachers to tell them what to do. And so when I would say, I'm getting a PhD in education, is that good enough for you? Um, that usually kind of helped people to recognize that I wasn't as like non unaware as they thought I was. Mm -hmm. So while I was working on that, I, as I mentioned, when I was in school, I was very active in student organizations. When I graduated, I became active in community organizations and professional organizations. And by this point in my career, I had become the, well, while I began my PhD, I was preparing to launch my first really huge conference. I was managing the Society for Technical Communications International um, Communication Conference. And that's a pretty big affair. That was 1,500 people. And I did a second one um, three years later as I was finishing my degree. And that one um, had about 1,800 um, people at that point. And that was, and so I really got an understanding of the financial side. That work also was also what got me the work in um, marketing communications because I'll never forget, I went into the interview and the guy, the manager was interviewing me and he said, you know, you really don't have the experience. I said, well, I do. It's just not where you're looking for it. You're looking for it in the jobs. And my jobs have been a little bit more not related to that. But if you look at the work I've been doing on these two conferences, I think you'll find that is quite relevant. And I went through each thing that I was going to be expected on the job and could explain I had experience for doing that. Um, I also got that job, got the interview because of a temporary assignment I'd had because I was eavesdropping one day. Even though I was working on this in this small business unit, um, group that was developing e-learning for the PC, we had somebody who was working part-time while she was on mat leave to organize an in-person conference for all the people that supported the PC line okay. in IBM. And we were in Atlanta and she was, they were all talking and I just happened to walk up and eavesdrop while they were talking. And she was talking about, they were looking at hotels and um, some challenges they were having. I said, well, was it a union hotel or not? Because I learned this through the work I was doing on the um, STC conference. And then she, her ears were like, what? And um, next thing I know, I'm co-planning this event. And then after that one, my then boss said, you know, I wanted, he wanted to transfer me someplace. I, I saw how happy you were doing that work. So I wanted to see if I could find you a job doing that full time. And he was right. I, I totally loved my job when I was doing the marketing. Um, after that, towards the end of that job, IBM was going through a major transition. And I was reaching the point where I had my first book and I also was about to do the comprehensive exam for my PhD. And I made kind of a risky decision to take a buyout package and start what for a short time would be my own business. And my very first job other than getting a consulting gig with IBM was to go and teach. And I taught a course at a local school that's now known as Kennesaw State. And I really loved it. And it, didn't make any money as a part-time instructor, but it was, I really enjoyed it. And so they asked me back and I did some more. And so I had never intended with the PhD to get an academic position. I intended, I always said three letters by my name for four figures for the day so I could be a consultant. But apparently some life had other plans for me. And the next thing I know, I, uh, I took a full-time job at there. I wasn't 100% committed to it. So I went on what I call my seven-year journey. 
where I would go in and out of academia. So I took that job. I got lured back into a consulting job and to move back to the, uh, Minnesota, I, this time in the Twin Cities. And so I went back there for two years. Then I decided, no, I really did want to go into academia. And I took a temporary um, teaching job at the University of Minnesota, running a distance ed program in TechCom, which was really good skills, still very early in the digital learning um, thing. So I, but what was funny is when I began at IBM in Atlanta, I was, and I was working on the training. They originally thought we were going to do live virtual training. Um, it was done with a closed circuit TV at the time. And so I was trained and then they said, no, no, you're going to be on the all um, self-study e-learning piece. So I never used that training. 13 years later for a completely different employer, I'm totally employing everything that I learned. So I'm really glad that I had that training. It was like maybe just two or three days, but it was obviously a very important two or three days. And it just goes, even though training is supposed to be used very quickly, sometimes it takes a long time, but it does get, the skills do get used. And from there, I ended up taking a tenure track job in Boston. Um, I was not happy in that job. So I, it was funny, I quit that job. It was the first time I did not have another job lined up. And I, I'll never forget, I quit at 12.30 and 12, on a Thursday, 12.30 a.m. Friday, I get a note from a university in Hong Kong where I've been doing some um, consulting on the prior summer. And they said, your visit for next summer has been approved. And I, they told me before there was no money. So I was that was a total shock. I said, well, I got some extra time if you want me to stick around. And so I ended up spending about a year there as a visiting professor. And I came back to my current, current position where I am. When I was in that tenure, second tenure track job, though, I probably had some of my most memorable publications. I wrote an overview of online learning, which um, I don't think many people have heard of now, but back then it was one of the most widely read books on e-learning. And then I had a couple of um, articles that were published in the journal Tech Communication. So I was having this dual track career in tech comm and in, um, as an instructional designer, as well as a dual track career in academia and industry because I continued to consult. And I had two articles that won best to show in the journal um, award competition. So, I mean, it, I felt like when I quit that job, there would be something in the end. And I'm glad I had that faith. And since then, I, you know, I went through the ranks and became assistant professor, associate professor, got tenure, um, now full professor. I'm currently a department chair. It's something I did on an interim basis before. I've worked as a program director many times for different programs and I've also worked in the provost's office for a university as an e-learning fellow, and my job was to promote um, e-learning among the faculty. <clears throat> it was a broad mandate without a whole lot of you know, teeth to it, but it, it was fun because I got to see some interesting projects, meet some really interesting people. And um, yeah, so that's kind of a quick snapshot overview of how I ended up where I am today. Well, it's a, <clears throat> it's a fascinating story, a fascinating journey that you've had, and and uh, quite diverse, and uh, I'm sure that that uh, serves your students well. Um, so let me uh, shift gears here a little bit. The name of my series here is HPT Videos, Human Performance Technology, also known by other names such as Human Performance Improvement and Performance Technology. And for those of us that come at this from a learning and development perspective, it's you know evidence-based practices for you know, instruction or training or learning. But uh, so can you share with us? So I first met you or knew of you through my involvement at NSPI. And I'd kind of lost track of you for a number of years in between that because I don't, I'm not sure that you were involved uh, uh, in the latter years. I haven't been very active uh, lately myself. So, but uh, so I knew your name. I knew you had this reputation, uh, which is why I wanted to include you in this series here to, to share your journey. But can you share with us what was your first exposure to this notion of human performance technology or performance improvement? It was definitely NSPI. Um, I went with, uh, I heard about NSPI when I started in Atlanta. Um, and there was a very active chapter there. And they had a Cracker Barrel every year, which I've since learned is like the thing at, you know, when that was known as ISPI, but it was NSPI then. And so I went with one of my classmates for my PhD. We went to an NSPI meeting. And a couple of things happened that night. They had someone there from Training Magazine um, who is kind of looking 
to promote their conferences and also looking for speakers. And I ended up um, from that meeting, I made a contact and the next thing I know I'm speaking for them for the next like 30 some years. Uh, so that that was end up being a very productive evening. Um, plus I got fed, um, which was nice. And, but that was the night that I was introduced and I start going to meetings on a regular basis. Within a year, I, I became very active in the chapter. I was vice president of programs, then president-elect and president. Um, and then I was also went to start going to the international conferences. The year I was president, they decided to hold their conference in Atlanta in 95, which would have been several years after my presidency. But um, I remember I was, the hotel invited me and the uh, president-elect at to dinner. And so it was happened to be one of the most famous restaurants in town. So that was kind of fun. Nice side benefit. But in terms of learning about performance technology, I, I would say that I learned about it, you know, the basic foundations just from NSPI chapter meetings. We didn't really have much of it in my program. In fact, I did mention it like when I did my comps, wrote about it in my dissertation, but it wasn't something that I learned about directly in any course because um, it still wasn't necessarily covered in coursework at that time. Mm -hmm. But the, I'd say that, if, and the, it was interesting because there was a model that was presented at the local chapter that I've only seen a couple of times since, but it's the simplest, clearest model I've ever seen of HPT. And it just says there are three lep, three different types of um, issues that affect performance, skills and knowledge, resources, motivation. And you have to address whatever the issue is. And then it can happen at one of three levels, the organizational level, the individual level, and then um, somewhere in between. And the reason I use that, because it could be a department, it could be a work group, it could be the next level up, because often the larger the organization, the more there, there are more levels there are. And then Roger Kaufman, I've read an article since, he likes to also look at it at the, uh, the late Roger Kaufman, I should say, um, at the societal level. Mm -hmm. And so that's, but it was that model that has always been in my brain, learned other models, learned about you know front-end analysis, um, a lot of interest in valuation, ROI, et cetera, et cetera, um, through, and I was active and ISPI has a community service program. I helped come up with, believe it or not, with the original version of that back in the early nineties. Um, and I worked on con several conferences. Um, I was on the program committees for those. So, but then my duties for STC, I was STC international president. And that's one of the reasons I get, got a little bit more quiet. And then after that, um, I started doing some volunteering with ATD, and then for a short time, I worked as a paid liaison between a AS, what was now ATD, then ASTD, and the higher ed community. So, mm -hmm. so can you share with us uh, to to help inform our audience about who were some of your most early influences in that whole realm? Um, uh, people, uh, articles, and books that uh, you came across that they might want to follow up with. Um, well, it's really interesting because it, it wasn't something I read early, but I, years later, I was asked to review an advanced copy of um, Harold Stolovich and Erica Keeps's uh, training and performance. I just think it's so, it, it was the building, it, it was the sequel to telling a training, but I thought it was so really clear. We actually use it as a textbook in the HPT course that we teach because I find that some of the other stuff is so esoteric that it's really difficult for people, especially newcomers, to grasp. Um, but that said, I think the handbooks, all three of them, um, handbooks of performance technology, the first two, you know, edited by Harold and Erica, and the third one by James Pershing, um, I'd say probably are the largest. And then the journal PIQ, Performance Improvement Quarterly, probably would be the other one that, you know, in terms of publications and, you know, they're articles I've read over the year and you know this week this one's interesting that one that one's the one that you know remains in my head but I would say overall that you know that's but it's supposed to be the journal on you know performance technology so that would be the one in terms of names I mean I was feel really kind of fortunate that you know I was there in the earlier days ISPI or then NSPI adopted performance technology as its you know guiding concept in the 80s so a lot of the founders of the concept. So I actually had a chance to meet Thomas Gilbert, um, Dick Lincoln, um, heard from people like Don Toasty, um, Margot Murray Hicks, people like that. And I'm sure I'm forgetting tons of people, of course, Harold and Erica. And 
so you know i mean i i feel kind of blessed for that i've met some people that are more um better known today people like ellen wagner um steve via chica um yes and great um, gara who um now is a dean of a faculty of education so well thank you so um uh, yeah there's a uh I, I think those of us who are lucky to be involved with that organization back in its early days and meet some of the gurus and learn from them, it was a fascinating experience. And they all had varied approaches per, uh, of pretty much the same thing. And so that was interesting to, to learn about their different nuances. But if I can't, well, and we'll get back to some uh, other influence, uh, uh, more uh, current uh, in a little bit, but uh, let me switch gears here and uh, as a way of uh, providing an example to our audience, and this is always a tricky question, so my apologies in advance, but if you were to give a 30 second elevator speech about what you do, let's say you're at some sort of a neighborhood party and somebody comes up to you and says, Saul, what do you do? Uh, what kind of a short 30 second elevator speech or uh, might you give them? All right, well, I'll give you two versions of it. The one, when I was a full-time consultant, um, my then like eight, nine-year-old nieces and nephews, they didn't understand it. So they said, well, we'll just tell people that you work at McDonald's. So I would give them McDonald's gift cards and tell them I got it at an employee discount. Um, now, I mean, it's lucky because I do work in academia. So I have a job title that will be really familiar with people. And that's usually what I use. I'm a professor, I teach. Yeah, you know, and like when I cross the border back into the US, they say, what do you do? And if I'm a professor, what do you teach? And I tell them basically, I teach people how to do their jobs. And that's, that is really clear. That primarily focuses on the training piece of it. And it's not that I don't occasionally work on other pieces of it, but I do find that most of my work falls in that realm. And it's something that people easily understand. And I'm very proud of the work that, you know, people in training and development do. So I'm pretty comfortable using that. I know a lot of other people aren't, but I, I, I'm very, very comfortable with that. And I think it's important work that we're doing. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know if you remember the, the uh, Claude Lineberry, the late Claude Lineberry uh, at NSPI conferences and ISPI conferences after that uh, would get up at the podium and uh, read his, a letter from Mama where she continuously complained about she didn't understand what the heck he did for a living and was it was it you know legal legit and it was always a hoot because it always resonated with me that it is so hard to explain what you do i've had relatives who have challenged me but how can you train somebody to do a job that you've never done yourself and you know that that of course is the challenge if you're really going to train people help them learn how to perform a job that you didn't, you know, through the various means of analysis and design and everything. But, but it's always a challenge for, for some of us to explain to others what it is we do uh, in, in some sort of a brief and succinct manner. Let me switch gears again here. Yeah. Uh, as a lifelong learner, where's your current focus on learning? And are you doing any writing uh, about it that others can uh, access? Well, there's my book behind me, Career Anxiety. Um, yes. That's a recent one. Yes. You've got yes. a number um, of books. So let me talk a little bit about that because that's where I've been spending a lot of my at least headspace. Um, the book was supposed to be originally kind of a treatise on some of the assumptions underlying the world of training and HPT and where there are some flaws in some of the broad assumptions. I'll just give you one example. Um, there is an assumption underlying a lot of the theory in that it certainly governs workplace learning that assumes that the instructional designer or human performance technologist is working internally, which is a really false assumption. Um, we don't know the exact percentages because it depends. You can get expenditure spent externally. You can get some studies and they really vary widely about the number of people that either work in totally independently or for a service provider but it's probably somewhere between 20 and 40% of our field is not working as what I call a captive employee. And what that means is in practical terms, um, assumptions about information that's available to you, as well as how you can change the scope of your job are just not really relevant because if you're working externally, you're working under a contract and the contract will specify the scope of the job. And if you want 
to change that scope, you'll need a scope change. And a lot of, as usually you also need more money and neither of which is available, but I would say the money is probably even, although the money is certainly probably not available, I'd say the scope change is probably not likely to happen because a lot of people don't want people intruding on their private space. And the, you know, most organizations, even if it was a government agency, there's a private space there that they don't want anyone traversing. And I think that's, I mean, some will give you, I've had different clients give different amounts of openness to their material, but um, so that's just one example. So that was what the book was originally going to look at. Um, and I don't know how, we just started talking about the digital transformation and it ended up becoming instead a career guide about the way the workplace is today, which is really, really different. And so many of us that have had first jobs or are in our like, you know, either decades into that first job or second job, or have reached a point in our lives where we need to make a change. The world that we, is kind of like if you tried to do dating now, I mean, it, which thank God I don't have to do. It's changed so much that I wouldn't even know how to do it. And I think the same goes for job searching. And also some of the terms and conditions of work are really changed a lot. And the, econ the impact of your own economic circumstances. If you're looking for a job in your 40s when you have a mortgage, you have kids that are getting ready to go to college, et cetera, et cetera, your ability to move and what you can accept for a salary are really different than when you're in your 20s and you hate your jobs. Like, I'm just going to say, screw it today and I'll figure out what I'm doing later. Um, you, you've got responsibilities to other people, to yourself, um, to your future. And so that needs to be considered. And so these are the kinds of things we want to explore. Uh, and the other thing that's different, the original book was meant to be more of an academic book. This one ended up being written for people who actually are looking for jobs or may find themselves in that situation and how do they prepare themselves. So that's been one area. I've got some funded, I got several funded research projects, um, some which are really mine, some of which I technically, I'm like the front person for my students. So one of them, one of my, my number one is a research project to look at informal learning. And there hasn't been a study since the early mid 1970s that actually asked people what people to just track what they're learning. And none of those, stud those studies were looking at everything that people studied, not just the work related. We're just looking at the work related. So and the findings are actually kind of interesting. Um, so far, but it's an incomplete data set, so I don't want to talk too much about it, but I, I there are some surprises in there for me, at least. Um, we're also going to ask training professionals later, what do they understand about informal learning to see where what people really do get and where we really do need to have an education effort going on. Um, the next project is looking at the integration of immigrant workers in what they call non-gateway cities. So these are second, third tier cities that are desperate for workers. Um, we're looking in the Quebec context, and I'm not sure if your viewers are fully aware of this one. We're French Canada, but they regularly reaffirm that French is the official language. And so these workplaces work in French. A lot of the immigrants, they will need to operate in French if they're going to succeed. And in those towns, like I can live in English here in Montreal. I know that the politicians don't like me to say that, but it's a fact. In other cities, I really could not. So I would have to function English and, and French. And so, and the difference, you know, people are coming from the Northern Africa, coming to, you know, which is warm and, you know, one particular culture, very different culture in, you know, remote Quebec where it's freezing in winter and how's that integration process. So that's really my, one of my students' PhD projects. I'm, finishing up a program evaluation for a not-for-profit, actually finishing up two. And one, this one I think was interesting because they tried a couple of experiments with it. Um, we were actually just tracking not whether programs were effective, but whether they were, um, what people were participating in. Because what people say, when they know what you're, or if you do a survey, what people say and what they're really doing may not match. And so we had, we were supposed to have some ability. Some of the systems that we're supposed to use to measure that stuff were not ready. So we used a proxy measure, which was not as good. But for proof of concept, it was really interesting. And the last one, believe it or not, I'm looking at the performance of a subsidized housing project built by a not-for-profit to see what impact it's having on the life of its residents. And we're doing year two of that right now. Um, most of the interviews are done. Most of the surveys of the residents are done. We use the survey instrument from um, Canadian Mortgage and Housing um, Corporation. But one of the things that's really interesting is how, like, even in this pandemic, 
how what a positive experience you know this has been for those residents they uh their health seems to be even in a pandemic their health seems to be as good if not better um economic outcomes are much better by having you know assured rent rates and so forth so those are some of the things i'm working on right now very cool i'm looking forward to uh seeing some of that uh, come out when it's available let me shift gears again here uh, a language and labels in our profession are uh, a challenge, I think, for people coming new into the profession, you know, is it called guidance or job aids or electronic performance support systems or workflow learning or performance support? I mean, we've got all these overlapping uh, labels for things, and it's a challenge. So my my question here, is there a performance improvement or learning and development term or phrase that you would like to define for us because perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued? what would you have for us? Um, there are two. The first one is educational technology. I teach in an educational technology program, which apparently, if you look at the hardcore, you know, rat definitions, is different than instructional technology um, and uh, supposedly superior to it. Uh, I, I think that splitting hairs over the definition um, I think the distinction is maybe in the heads of a few people, even if they've written it down. And I think in the, first of all, in the eyes of most people, they would be the same thing, number one. But number two, if you ask a lay person, what does educational technology mean? They would think what we're doing right now, using the computer, using the, the software for educational purposes. You read the definition, it's not even related to that. It's instructional design. So if it's instructional design, why isn't it called instructional design? I find that to be incredibly misleading. So I just define, and you know, I've had you know, people staunchly defend the term. You know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. So when I teach it to my students, I show them the official ACT definition, and then I tell them, this is my definition. It's the hardware, software, and thinkware of education, um, with the operative word being thinkware, which is really the processes. And I get that why, in a most most technical sense that instructional design processes and approaches could be thought of as a technology, I would just tell you that most people would call it a process um, or an approach or a framework. But technology, I just because technology is so pervasive and it has such a particular term, I just think it's such a horrible term. Personal feeling. Second one I want to take on is the word learning. Learning is something that students do. We do not do learning. I don't do anything to do with learning. I may work in a learning and development department, but let me be really clear. It's a stupidly named department. It's a training and development. And for some reason, I have no idea because people have some low self-esteem issue with the word training. We have tried to banish it from our vocabulary. I will tell you that we are the only ones banishing it from our vocabulary. If you ever go outside, you look at a public policy and there it's downturn. And what do they put money in for? It's training with a T, not learning with an L, because they know it's training. The public knows that word. They don't know learning and development. You, ask, you even do a survey of people and you ask them, what is that skill called? Unless they're in our field, they call it training. I think we need to acknowledge it's not a dirty word. It is nothing in the earth to be ashamed of. We should be proud of it. Um, I think we need to reclaim and own that word. The other thing is, I, it was a cute story. Um, when I was on the board of what is now the Institute for Performance and Learning, then it was the Canadian Society for Training and Development. One of my colleagues um, on the board, who was a training director, um, they used, I, forget, I think they had performance or something in there. And all of his counterparts said, like, what the heck is it that you do? He goes, we do training. He said, oh, now I understand. Well, if you have to translate it and call it training, then why don't you just call it training? I yeah. so much agree with you. I, I tried to fight off the uh, the switch, which to me occurred in the 90s after Senge's book, uh, The Fifth Discipline and the Learning Organization. All of my corporate clients started changing the names of their organizations from something like training and development to learning and development, to be focused on the learner. And I thought, well, we were always focused on the learner and their performance requirements, but. No, I, some of this stuff is we don't do training. We do learning. We don't do learning. That's a pro. Look at the dictionary. We can't do that. 
we facilitate it, but we don't do it. But if you look at the field, I mean, the name in the 70s, they were trying to put human resource development, um, which is the name that a, a large academic organization still uses for the field, but it's not limited to training. It also incorporates conferences on um, career development and organization development who may or may not actually believe they're part of that umbrella. That's another story. Then you've got human performance technology, human performance improvement, which are the same thing, but different people, per, you know, organizations. Yep. And again, it's one where they might split hairs and say there's a difference between the two, but the reality is one was using HPT, the other decided to come in and compete and change it to HPI. Yeah. So um, I, I feel like, you know, we're more like an FBI poster with a bunch of aliases and you have to keep training, tracking it. And I, I, I just wish we would have a little bit more pride in the name that is probably... Yeah, I, education also applies to the work that we do. I My very first day in training, my manager sat me down and said, training is for six months or sooner. Education is for longer term. Always love that definition. I've revived it recently because I just think it's so useful. My favorite example of that was uh, uh, Bob Baker at an, an NSPI conference in the 80s. He got up and said, what's all this controversy about? You already know the difference between training and education, and I'll prove it to you. You send your daughter off to college and she writes home and says that she's taking a sex education course. And you think, oh, or she writes home and says she's taking a sex training course. <laughs> yeah. And the audience erupted. He said, see, you already know the difference. <laughs> but but the language is a challenge. And I feel bad for the new people coming in trying to navigate all of these terms and uh, that are overlapping and, you know, is, is HPT, you know, the same or different than HPI. And uh, we just make it m much more difficult for those people. And I, and I feel sorry for them. Yeah. Okay. So the other term that I think is really kind of interesting is the learn word learning experience, the term learning experience design, which is coming into use as a replacement for instructional design. And yeah, I've tried to do a little bit of tracing of the term. It seems to emerge from in about 2007, somebody wrote a piece about it. If you look at the person's background, they have a user experience design background. Mm -hmm. um, they were probably asked to work on a learning project or a training project or a teaching project, whatever you want to call it, um, but had no familiarity with instructional design, and which is totally plausible. And if you look at a lot of e-learning, to be really honest, the learning experience is something that is an opportunity for improvement in many of them. So he was applying his UX stuff to that and decided to create this new field. There's just one problem. It was done completely ignorant of the field of instructional design, number one. So you see a lot of learning experience design programs emerging, usually in continuing ed space, not so much in the academic space. Um, and you see some younger academics, you know, trying to publish about learning experience design because it's an open area and you know, it's a good opportunity for them. What I find really interesting, I saw a presentation at Academy of Human Resource Development um, conference during the pandemic and a group of students were really worried. They were in a human resource development program and instructional design course. They said, you're not preparing us for the jobs. And like, they want us to be learning experience designers and we're not. And so she actually analyzed these jobs and look at the requirements and look to what they were covering. And they were the same as an instructional designer. And I am working on an article where I, be, I stole her idea, um, although I did credit it. Um, so I'm not completely stealing. <laughs> and basically just looked at a couple of job ads and there really isn't a lot of difference. I think it's just, it goes back to this issue with training. We have some esteem issues about our profession. And I think we probably need to invest a little bit more energy in taking pride in the work that we do um as opposed to keep changing the name because again i'll come back to that thing you tell people whatever you keep changing the name you never no identity gains traction if every name is thrown out the wall to see what sticks and if the one that sticks repeatedly no matter what you throw at the wall is the name that you're trying to run away from maybe what you need to do is stop running and start acknowledging so that's my personal feeling about that Oh, I, I agree. This this uh, 
this difference without much of a distinction between instructional systems design done correctly, which is one of the issues, I think, and learning experience design should have been the same thing. We were always focused on the user and the user's experience and their experience in the learning process, in the training process, and their ability to then go and apply what they've learned back on the job. And so we were always focused on that if we were doing it right. But I think one of the yeah. one There's of the some issues practices, has been though. that so many people are new and unexperienced and un uh, uh, unknowing of the principles and practices that they should be employing. They're just creating content, and I attribute it, it was bad before all these authoring tools came out, where every subject matter expert in the world could crank out some course. I remember Dick Clark, uh, Richard E. Clark, talking to me about this. Is that you know, due to the non-conscious nature of knowledge, if a if an expert were to create a course, it would be missing up to seventy percent of what a novice needs in order to perform, because they don't. They're just giving you everything that they consciously know, and that's not going to be enough. And we, you know, that means we put people through formal learning, and then we force them to go on an informal learning, into an informal learning mode to figure out how to apply what it is they've learned and and they may be successful with that ultimately but it certainly isn't efficient but we but, but that's a that's a great example that's really current here about some of our language issues i think and and people really working really hard to to uh, show a distinction between those two i read some yeah i'd LinkedIn say that there the are some about that there's some ux practices that they recommend but i, but I find really interesting my when i revised training design basics which is one of the books i wrote in 2016, I put, I, I add, I mean, I put some of this in the earlier version, but I really heavily um, rewrote this section where you use things like scenarios and, um, or they call them use cases in UX. And I made some of the adaptations, the scenario for the purpose of learning. And then the personas, because I do think they're really useful concepts. Um, I think the one adaptation of scenarios, which I think a lot of people don't do, most people focus on the scenario when they're learning. I think what you really need to focus on is what is somebody doing when they have actually mastered the skills and knowledge and they're actually doing whatever it is they're supposed to be doing so that you can prepare. That gives you the idea of what the case is supposed to be. But again, this can all be structured within the traditional ISD framework. And I don't I mean, I'm not saying that the sensitivity doesn't need to be there, but I find in the end, there's just a complementarity um, and it's not one is better than the other. And a lot of learning experience designer jobs, when you get right down to it, are the same as instructional design jobs. And I think the lack of a, the multiple job titles for the same position, again, if we're trying to brand the profession, not really good. Yeah. And of course, there's the whole, you know, the, the, the buyers here, the uh, uh, employers who are hiring and the recruiting and the managers you know, I think that's why students can have a little bit of a career anxiety, if you will, about, you know, am I be, you know, here's this language that I'm being taught under and the jobs are asking for, you know, so that they could worry about that. So I think, you know, our, our poor, the poor people yeah. coming into the organization. Well, let me switch gears here one more time here yeah. and ask you. So if you were to do some shout outs about people that you think our audience, which I'm going to assume here, maybe incorrectly, is people new to the field, uh, trying to figure out how to navigate into the field here, who are some of the more current people that you might point our audience to that you think should influence their practice? Um, interesting. Uh, that's funny because I've written down some notes and now I'm changing them in my head. Um, <laughs> right. I first want to give a shout out to some Canadians who um, the work may a bit more behind the scenes, but people will have an opportunity to, you know, find their work. Um, one's Lynette Gillis, um, who is a consultant up here and she's based outside of Toronto. Louise Grummet, um, whose main claim to fame for most Canadians is she's really the brains behind the competency model that's used for certification of professionals here. And unlike some of the other certifications, this one's actually pretty widely adopted within Canada, which I think is really neat. Um, also just a, an amazingly pleasant person to work with. Um, another one, a Canadian, um, again, I'm not sure he's gonna be on a lot of people's radar, 
Um, he's the president of a company called Knowledge One, which is a subsidiary of my university. His name is Robert Beauchemin, but he's been working in simulation training since like the mid 80s. And he's done some really cool projects before he came in to lead Knowledge One that simulated factories so that people in a company was building a brand new factory in a country. They could train people before they were able to open it in a simulated way so people could actually be ready for work pretty close to day one or at least month one um, when the you know, factory was operational. And he continues to do a lot of that advanced work, looking at pushing the boundaries of simulation and virtual reality kinds of training. So the three Canadians, I'd like to share a couple other shout outs. Patty Shank, um, I would be remiss not to mention her. She, of course, was a co-author with one of my books. So there is obviously a, that connection there. But her work recently, where she's really trying to synthesize research for practice, it's a passion project for her, and she's done an amazing job with that. My co-authors, Margaret Driscoll and Yvonne Thayer. Yvonne primarily works in the career development and community college sector. Margaret works in the corporate sector. I think I learned more about technology from Margaret than I have learned from anybody in this field. And um, Yvonne, same, really, I've learned a lot more about the university environment in some ways from her work than I've learned from many others um and including my own personal experience and then um just a few others um they're a little bit more um traditional but um bob reesers um yeah i believe he's retired now from florida state but i think his work is pretty um amazing and then um god the last one's just escaping me so we'll leave it with bob reeser he breaks the history of the field. And I think, you know, those who do not learn their history are doomed to repeat it. So I think it may not be a bad idea to become familiar with it. No, oh, that's a that's an excellent point here. Uh, so I'll thank you so much for doing this video interview with me, especially doing it the second time. <laughs> My okay. apologies again about I that. I like the second one better anyway. I was a little bit, I was a little bit better uh, rehearsed. <laughs> That's what it was. That first one was yeah. rehearsal. Uh, my final question to you, and I think this is uh, apropos as as you are involved with students and getting them prepared to come into the to the workplace. Uh, what what parting words of wisdoms might you have for people new to the field um, related to all things performance improvement? I'd say the number one piece of advice I can give you is that and i hope this doesn't sound really never get too comfortable um and first of all never get comfortable with the answer somebody gives you or especially when someone brings a complaint to you there's often more to it and you need to dig deeper and so you need to resist the urge to solve first and then find out second when you solved it the wrong way and that's a lesson i continue to learn to this day um through mistakes um, but I also think in positions, I mean, it's easy. I've seen people, in fact, what really one of the things that on a personal level inspired me with the book Career Anxiety was seeing people who had gotten really comfortable in jobs and then have the wool run, you know, pulled under them. And in many cases, a, a really, a couple, a really, really sad story. There was a guy I knew who um, was a student at the time, but he was an old, a, a more mature student. And he earned a B in a class and he was very upset. He wanted an A and it was a kind person said, I'm really cooperative with everyone. And I said, you know, I'll buy, I'll buy you dinner. It's like, first of all, I'm not accepting a meal, but I'll be happy to meet with you on campus and explain how you earned a B. Never heard from him. Um, and the lesson in that particular case I wanted to explain to him was that he actually had, according to his classmates, um, cause I had a, a, a a journal that was required with this assignment was a group project. He was quite harassing to many of the other people. And he was not, he was either oblivious to the behavior or um, was just, if people pointed out, he just goes in, goes out, nothing stuck. When they had a layoff at his company, they only laid off two people. He was one of the two. And that's a really common story. A lot of people think I'm doing a great job. The last person you should ever listen to about how good a job you're doing is yourself. You, you are not the best judge of you. What are the external signs? That's the lesson you can, and you'll need to go look really far. Look to your HPT knowledge. That will tell you what indicators would tell me that this is a reasonably effective thing. Or get second opinions. 
had an incident recently. I actually thought things went well. I didn't trust my instinct. So I actually went to people and said, I do not trust my instinct on this. Was I, am I correct in assuming this? And, you know, I, fortunately I could trust my instinct on that one, but um, that, but I think by not getting comfortable and always wondering, always trying to do better. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, in a field where technology, both the intellectual technologies and more importantly, the software and hardware technologies are constantly evolving. I don't think it's quite as dramatic changes, but there are enough shifts and they end up becoming dramatic over time. Failing to stay up with that is a huge problem. But I think the one that's, it's, it's easy to, you know, look at the hardware and software because that's really tangible. It's that other stuff where processes evolve over time, terminology evolves over time. You have to figure out, is it really something different or is it really like the learning experience design? Clearly I have an old timer's view. I mean, but I'm saying, newcomers might say, oh no, it's completely different. There's obviously gonna be some perspective, but when you can go and say there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between A and B, that's when you know the terminology has changed. Social attitudes, another one that's really important, it does end up getting reflected in our work. That's important, but and getting comfortable that I know the world. The world is an evolving place. Um, so just be aware that you too have to evolve. I always like getting sentimental. I always think about my grandmothers when they both passed away because they were born and raised in worlds they were not raised to, and the, they died in the worlds they were not born and raised to live in. And I think that's true of all of us. And the only way we can thrive in the world that we live in is not by throwing away the lessons that we learned, that's not it. But it's figuring out how those lessons morph with the world that we're living in today. Excellent, excellent advice. It's, that is so true. Uh, uh, don't stay comfortable and appreciate the fact that you're going to have to evolve and don't necessarily always rely on just your own instincts. You know, ask others for their perspectives. Absolutely. So I'll thank you again so much for doing this. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, reading what you're going to be producing. And I hope our, our, our audience will continue to. Uh, follow you and your words of wisdom, but thanks again. Thank you. Have a great day. I look forward to seeing the video. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.